let's talk about what we're going to be using the object buffer for. I basically want to have an alpha pass of everything that looks like these little paint strokes um, on my head, even these headphones, um, pretty much everything except for my background. So with that in mind, we need to set up a compositing tag that will catch everything but the background. So I'm going to twirl everything up. So this head and headphones also contains all the sweeps. So we'll be able to just place one compositing tag on that. Um, then we've got all of these sweeps here that were our first set of sweeps. Then we've got our background sweeps. So you could create a null object that contained all your sweeps if you wanted to. But if you're worried about it messing anything up and you want to have them all out, you don't have to do it that way. It'll just save you some time on your tags. But to set up the tag itself, you'll want to come up here to tags, go to Cinema 4D tags, come down to compositing. And it doesn't matter which one you drop it on first. I'll just start it up here at the top. And it doesn't, I'm just going to leave all of these on um, because I, I'm not really worried about that part of it. I'm just going to come over here to Object Buffer and I'm going to enable Buffer 1. That's all you have to do. And then you just want to make sure that that tag is also on all of the other things that need to be part of that Object Buffer. So that need to be part of the Alpha Channel that will basically involve anything that has color besides the background. So I'm just going to start control dragging to duplicate that down over pretty much anything that has a texture except for that texture there on the sky and obviously we don't need it on the camera. So just control drag down seems to be pretty fast. And then we only need one for the head and headphones uh, null here because that'll, that'll grab everything that's inside of that. Okay, so now that object buffer has been set up through our compositing tag, but we also need to set it up through our render settings. So let's go ahead and just set all of our render settings so we can set off our render. So we'll come up here to render, go to edit render settings, and I'm going to come up here to my output and I'm going to change this frame range from manual to all frames. So that's going to take me all the way to that 650th frame uh, that we added in there. Okay, then let's come up here to save. We need to tell this where to save to. So I'll go ahead and check on save here check on save there and now we can define a file um, or a, pl a place for this to be saved to. So you want to click this little browse button and we're just here inside of your project files. So let's go into your reference files folder and we'll cre create a new folder by right clicking go to new folder and let's call this we'll just use one folder for all of the passes we'll be creating. So we'll call this um, watercolor flow. Alright, so we'll go into watercolor flow and we'll just rename that same thing here. And go ahead and save that. And then the format is going to be TIFF with PSD layers, which is great. That's what I want. Um, but I also want a multi-pass because I want to save an object buffer as a separate pass. So I need to check on my multi-pass and that's going to give me this little option here. So I'm going to save that and we'll come over here and also define the place that it will save to. And again, let's go into that watercolor flow folder that we just created. And I'm going to name this one the same thing as before because it will also add this layer name as suffix by default. So if that's checked on, it'll do like an underscore AO if it's an ambient occlusion, or in my case, it'll say object or buffer, or something like that, that shows that it's part of the object buffer for this multi pass. And then we've got our regular image up here. Now, Right now, the multi-pass image isn't going to do anything because we haven't told it that it, the multi-pass needs to output anything. It just is saying there's going to be a multi-pass. So if we come over here to the multi-pass button, we can choose object buffer. And that is already set to group ID 1 by default, which is what we have enabled. Perfect. So let's come back up here to multi-pass um, and save and see 
Um, everything still looks good since we added that after the fact, except it's going to save them as PSDs, which are kind of big files. So you can come in here and change this to something else, maybe like a TIFF with PSD layers, which is exactly what we have up here. So that'll work great. Okay, um, let's take a look at our anti-aliasing. That's set to best, which is what I want. If yours is set to geometry or none, we'll choose best. Um, I don't really mess with these options. So we won't worry about that. So everything looks good. And we've got our output. Again, make sure that's at all frames so you've got that those extra 50 frames that we added. Okay, we'll get out of this. And then let's go to our render queue. So we'll come up here to render. And I usually like to check my render queue to see if there's anything I rendered previously. And then I'll delete it. So we'll open it up. Render queue looks empty, so we'll come up here again, render, and add it to render queue, which will automatically open it up, and it will also ask us if we want to save our changes, which we do want to do. So um, let's save this as our end file for this lesson, so that's going to be 14 underscore end. So we'll say um, no for now, because we don't want to save over the begin. So I'm going to just save as in this case. So right here where your Cinema 4D files are being saved, and I'll just save it as 14 end. Perfect. And then we'll come back up here to our render queue, and I'm going to delete out the begin version. And we'll come up here and add it to the render queue as our end version. So that's the one we want to render. And you can double check again to make sure that this is going into the place you want. Multipass going into watercolor flow, named watercolor flow. Everything looks good. So you want to make sure that render is checked on right there. Then you'll come up to jobs and click start rendering. This render for me takes about 12 minutes. So depending on your computer, um, it may take a little more, may take a little bit less, but overall it shouldn't take too crazy long. So um, stick around and in the next lesson we will be um, starting to add a little bit of uh, things like motion blur and setting up our composite in After Effects. We aren't rendering motion blur in Cinema 4D. Um, if you didn't pay attention to that or you didn't notice, not a big deal um, because we will be doing it in post and getting a little bit better outcome actually by doing it there instead of here. Um, so there's also issues like if we had ever used something maybe like a sketch material, um, if you wanted to add something like that to this, you can't use use the, the physical render, which is great for motion blur. You have to use the standard. And so we didn't end up using a sketch material, but it is something you could maybe experiment around if you're already kind of familiar with this sort of technique that we're doing with something sort of flat. Um, so again, just easier to put your motion blur in after the fact in post with a project like this, especially since we don't have a lot of really fast movements. Adding motion blur later will be super easy. So it's estimating this one's going to take about 10 minutes, which might be even better. It might go up, might go down. So see you in the next lesson, and we'll begin compact files in the After Effects folder. And it's just basically an empty After Effects project. So if you just want to open After Effects at this point, go right ahead. You're not starting any further behind me. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring in our passes that we rendered in our last lesson. So I'm going to right click over here in the project panel, go to import and choose file. And we're just here inside of your project files folder. You want to go into your reference files folder and we'll grab that watercolor flow. And the first one we've got there is your object buffer. And then the second one is your watercolor flow. So uh, you can select that first one. Go ahead and hit import. You want to make sure that TIFF sequence is checked on. That's going to take a second to bring that in. Remember, we were working at 30 frames per second. So when you bring in a sequence, if you have your default settings in After Effects to bring it in at a frame rate other than 30, you'll want to change that. Um, but it's going to default to 30, which is what we were using, so that's fine. Now let's bring in our color, since that's just our object buffer. We'll right click, go to import file, and then just come down past that object buffer, choose any one of those watercolor flows, import, and then we'll have our color information. Okay, so let's grab that color information and drag it onto the create a new composition button. And now we can really start to get a feel and a view of 
of our composition and it looks really really pretty really happy with the way this turned out okay so let's start talking about what we want to accomplish in After Effects and how we want to change this because it already looks really quite good just coming straight out of Cinema 4D but what are some things we can change and make better here in After Effects well we can start to give this some more texture and something that's going to make it feel like you can't just render it uh, out of Cinema 4D with the look that we're going to give it. So I want to bring in some other things from that reference files folder besides just these passes. So we're going to right click and import some files again but go up a little bit and we're going to bring in that concrete the lens flare and the watercolor. So I just control clicked those three to add them to a selection and now we'll import those. And now I want you to grab that watercolor JPEG and drop it on top of your color pass. So what you see here is this really beautiful and interesting looking uh, kind of piece of watercolor here. Um, and it's a pretty large picture so if you just move it up a little bit you get this really nice texture kind of just on top of everything. So you don't even really need to scale it up for it to cover your whole composition. Now I want to create sort of a moving pulsing watercolor effect. So I'm going going to create um, some turbulent noise. So I'm going to do that on top of this on another layer. So we'll come up here and go to layer, new, and just create a black solid. Okay. And then with this black solid, we're going to add the turbulent noise effect. So let's come up here to window, grab your effects and presets panel, and we'll come over here and type in turbulent and grab your turbulent noise drop that on there then you might want to get back out of effects and presets just so uh, you've got more room to work with here and I'm gonna change my fractal type from basic to dynamic because I just like the way that this kinda looks a little more watercolored uh, with the lines that you get here and then what I want to do is you'll notice if I scrub there's no movement so I can key the evolution of this over time. So I'm going to control click that evolution or excuse me you don't need to control click it you can just click the stopwatch there on evolution then we'll come all the way to the end of our uh, animation and I'm going to turn this up to something like maybe a five. Okay so you can just type that in if you want and it's going to automatically key that for you. So now if I scrub forward you'll see how it just kind of moves and pulses over time. So now how do we get this to interact with the watercolor? The way I'm going to do it is to grab my switches and modes and come in here and where it says normal I'm going to turn it to multiply. So now I've got this really interesting effect where it almost looks like the watercolor itself is moving. So we've got that pretty texture and then we've also got that turbulent noise. Now I only want to show this watercolor and the effect we've added to it in the areas that are colored in my project here. So I don't want it to affect the background. Now I can use that piece that we created, that object buffer, to cut that out. So if I pull this open, our object buffer is right here. You'll notice I can bring this down. Um, I'm just going to, for a second, place it on top of the color pass. And we'll turn off those two things we created so you can see it. So it's basically just a black and white image of everything else that we um, created that had color. So if I come in here to my uh, track mat and I turn that to Luma mat, you'll notice that now I don't have a background I just have those colored pieces so because of that we can use um, that object buffer to cut out this same idea of cutting out the background um, but we'll do it for these two pieces right here but we can't do it to um, 
more than one piece at a time. You'll see how these two are working together to use that object buffer as the luma mat. I can't just grab that uh, mat and put it on top of both of those and change one track mat. You've got to uh, do a little bit more to get that to work. So I'm going to come in here and we'll change that back. Turn that off. Turn back on the visibility of the object buffer. And what I want to do is pre-compose the black solid and the watercolor together. So shift select both of those pieces and we'll hit control shift C and we'll call this watercolor watercolor and we'll call it watercolor move okay so go ahead and say okay to that and now we've got that in its own pre comp so now that's as if it is one layer so now if we turn on our um, object buffer that's on top of that now that that's in one layer we can go into it if we want to change anything now we can come into our track mat and change that to luma mat and what will happen is it will be cut out of that area. But now we're losing all of our beautiful color from our original render. So how do we get that back? We can simply use a blending mode with it to get those colors back and blend them with our watercolor. So come in here where you see normal on the one that does have its visibility turned on and we'll change it to overlay. So now we've got that really interesting looking uh, color with our background. Now I'm going to come in here and turn this resolution from half to full so we don't have those little jagged edges. And you can kind of start to see how that looks and how those colors are interacting with each other. Really, really interesting look. Okay, great. So stick around. We're going to have one more lesson where we'll be creating the final look and adding just a couple more things to the overall. I'm going to place it on top of everything else. And I want to change its blending mode again, um, just like before, to overlay. But I don't want it to be quite so harsh and just so um, kind of overpowering of everything. So I want to turn down its uh, opacity. So with this layer selected, you can hit the T key to only only bring up the opacity property and turn that down a good amount. So right in there around 20 or 30 percent is good. Okay, so that just kind of helps to unite the fore and background with a single texture. Now I do want this to have a little bit of movement so it doesn't appear quite so static. So what we can do is actually wiggle this with an, with an expression. So with concrete selected, we'll wiggle the position. So you want to hit the P key this time to bring up the position. And we'll alt click the stopwatch to put this into expression mode. And we're going to use a really simple expression which is wiggle. So you'll just type in the word wiggle. And then you're going to use parentheses to define the values that will tell it how much and how often we want it to wiggle. So go ahead and create an open parenthesis. And the first number is going to say how many times per second do we want this to wiggle. So let's just try two. Every second we want this wiggle to happen twice. So we'll put a two. Then I'm going to put a comma to separate the next number. And the next number is going to say how much do you want it to wiggle. So it's going to wiggle two times a second and how far do you want it to go. So this, if you're doing position, it's going to be measured in pixels or in these values that you see here, which are pixels because 640 by 360 is right here in the middle. We're working at 1280 by 720. So um, 640 is right there. 360 is right there. So if you're thinking about this in terms of pixels, five pixels is a small amount, but it still is going to go a long way if you see that movement. So let's try something like five. So we want this to move five pixels up or down, side to side, diagonal, any direction it can go um, in the uh, X and Y axis, and we're going to have it do it two times every second. Okay, once you're happy with that, close your parentheses and you can just click anywhere to disengage from expression mode and then I'm gonna solo this concrete for a second so you can only see the concrete layer and then if we scrub it you can see how it kind of
is just jittering around really, really subtly. Okay, so now I'm going to unsolo it, so we're back to where we were before, and I'm going to hit the zero key on my number pad. So what this is going to do is allow us to kind of just view this in After Effects with the um, just the values that we've put in so far. You'll be able to see kind of the way that the different pieces are interacting and you're able to see kind of how those textures move over time um, with those different parts added and if you want to maybe change the blending mode of something you could do that if you feel like you don't like the way overlay looks for the watercolor um, you can change that there's so many blending modes um, if you select a layer that has a blending mode and you want to just kind of quickly scan through see which blending mode you like the best select it hold shift and hit the plus key and just move through those really quickly it'll just cycle you through um, and you'll be able to see all those different ones kind of all just really fast without having to go in and change it through the drop-down mode so um, I'm not going to preview the whole thing but we can just see right there that first part looks really really awesome I love the way that looks and I like this kind of very subtle little texture that's on top of everything um, and that it's moving just very very um, subtly there okay so now one of the things I want to add is my motion blur so let's come in here to our window, open back up our effects and presets, and Motion Blur has been improved greatly since Creative Cloud came out. And there's a new effect called Pixel Motion Blur. So type in Pixel, and Pixel Motion Blur is going to be there at the bottom. And all you have to do is grab it and drop it on to uh, your colors here. So what that's going to do is it's going to add just a little bit of Motion Blur to that part. And then you also want to add Pixel Motion Blur to your object buffer. So both of the pieces that you have um, basically gotten your uh, render out of Cinema 4D through, those are the ones you want to add Pixel Motion Blur to. If you only add it to one, it's not going to be cut out properly from the other one, like if you don't add it to the object buffer. Now, at 100%, I can zoom in here. At 200%, you can really start to see that motion blur. And you can also see it in the background as that's added, too. So very helpful the way that it does that. And I just really like that they've taken that pixel motion blur and made it an effect that's only that. It actually used to be part of the time uh, warp effect, but they just took it out. And now it's just pixel motion blur. And it's really easy to use and just drop on things really quickly. Okay, so now we've got um, some motion blur. Let's also add this lens flare that we have in here. So what's that all about? This piece over here, if you go back to your project panel, lens flare, and I drop this on top of everything, you can see it's kind of a really bright looking layer. And I can move it back and forth. You can see what that looks like. So what I like to do with this piece, it's just something I've painted in Photoshop. I like to move this over so that the edge of it is kind of just right there on the edge of the composition. And then I like to kind of move this across my painting over time. So if I come in here to that normal mode and change it to a blending mode of add, you can see everything through it, but everything underneath it kind of gets that color attributed to it and it really starts to make those colors look more interesting. But it's a little bit over the top. Um, it looks a little bit like a crazy 80s music video. So let's change it from 100% opacity by hitting the T key and we'll turn it down to just a 10% opacity. So now we kind of have that nice little sweep right there, a little bit of pink up here, a little more orange. So it makes the whole thing a little more, have a little more depth, but it doesn't change it so drastically overall. And then you can edit it over time by just kind of slowly moving it from one side to the other. So I'll just come over here at the beginning, we'll select it, hit the P key, set a key just by clicking that stopwatch for position, and then we can go all the way to the end. And I'm just gonna click it, hold shift, and drag it over just like that. And um, it'll automatically key that position for me, which isn't quite so easy in Cinema 4D. You gotta click it every time. So come over here, unless you have auto key turned on, obviously. Okay, so I'm just coming through here, taking a look at what that feels like. I really like it. It's not 
per se, you know, technically a lens flare, but it does kind of have that flare look to it, like maybe old film from the 70s or something kind of gets a weird little um, flash across it, but it also does help to give that light um, a different tint all the way across. So I like the way that that works with it. Now, one last thing I want to do is add a vignette. So we'll come up here, add a new layer. So go to layer, new, solid, black again is what we want. And then you're going to come up here to your tools, um, your shape tools, where you see the rectangle tool. You'll want to hold that and come down to your ellipse tool. And then I'm just going to start up here in the upper left hand corner left click and drag this down and you see it's created a mask for me so um, I've created a mask just kind of right here around the edges now in all previous versions um, or most previous versions that you'll probably remember the masks have been defaulting to yellow but now depending on uh, what color your layer is your mask is going to default to that color too. So um, that can be helpful. So um, now if you've updated your Creative Cloud, you should see red masks instead of yellow. So now we're going to invert that so that we can have this vignette on the outside. Then I'm going to come into my mask options. We'll turn up the feather a little bit and then maybe expand it so it's not quite so harsh on the edges. Maybe a little bit more feather right in there. And once you're happy with the way that your vignette looks, you might want to kind of pull this open and out a little bit and zoom in a little bit further and see what everything looks like on 100%. So just make sure you don't have any kind of weird little errors happening. Make sure everything's looking the way you want it to look. So some of our pieces, you know, coming in there, slowing in at the end. And we've just got this really nice little ending where it's riding out and our camera's kind of slowing down and we're just looking at this very, very slowly at the end. So um, I think that this turned out really, really nicely. Um, so you'll probably want to take a second to preview this um, and see if there's any little changes you want to make to maybe the movement of your watercolor or something else in here. But overall, great job. Thanks for watching the course and 